Hello, every, everyone, and welcome to our webinars on remote sensing for conservation and biodiversity. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I'll be doing the webinar today on remote sensing for conservation, and my colleague Amber McCullum will be doing the webinar on biodiversity. As a reminder, we are offering these webinars um, in two one-hour sessions on today, January 22nd, and a second one on biodiversity on January 24th. The same content will be presented at the two different times each day. The webinar recordings, the presentations, and the homework assignment can be found after each session um, at the website listed here. And then following the end of this session, we will have a Q&A session. You can an answer, ask questions of us. Um, and then after the session, you can send us emails um, at our email addresses listed here. There will be one homework assignment. Um, the answers will be submitted via a Google form. Um, and the deadline for that homework is February 7th. You will also get a certificate of completion if you have attended both live webinars and completed the homework assignment by the deadline. Just a note that you will receive certificates about two months after the completion of the course. There's only one prerequisite for this webinar since this is an overview webinar and we highly recommend that you take a look at Introduction to Remote Sensing, our on-demand webinar, or have equivalent knowledge, some level of remote sensing. For the webinar today and the webinar that we'll be doing on Thursday to access course materials you'll need to go to this FTP website that's listed here. So this is a little different than we've done in the past where we've had all our materials available on the RSET website. But for this webinar series, you'll need to go to this FTP website and you can see an example um, of what that FTP website is and then download that material to your computer. So in session one, I will be discussing remote sensing for conservation. And in session two, Amber McCullum will be discussing remote sensing for biodiversity. Both of these webinars are overviews of each of these topics and will include case studies so you can see how remote sensing is used for different aspects of conservation and biodiversity. So we're really happy that all of you have joined this webinar. And as you watch, um, this webinar and listen to information about, especially about the case studies. Um, if there are ways that you can let us know what you are specifically interested in, if there's a specific tool or a methodology um, or an approach um, that you would like maybe more in-depth um, training on, please feel free to let us know. So our agenda for today is first an overview of remote sensing for conservation. Then I'll be discussing habitat suitability um, and the uses of remote sensing data for assessing habitat suitability and a case study example. Then I'll discuss species population dynamics. Again, um, emphasizing the uses of remote sensing data as well as a couple case studies. And lastly, I'll discuss wildfire monitoring for conservation, the uses of remote sensing data, and one case study. First, a little bit about habitat suitability. It's very difficult to determine exactly where different animal and plant species currently are because of the challenges in collecting that information. Often, species location information collected in the field is combined with environmental information to, to determine habitat preferences. Then models are used to estimate where potential habitat is using the environmental or predictor variables that are best correlated with species presence. Those models can then be used to identify other geographic regions with similar environmental characteristics. 
On the right, a habitat suitability index was derived for identifying potential habitat of jaguars in Mexico. A habitat suitability index describes the suitability and quality of a given habitat by combining the interactions of all key environmental variables into a model. Species distribution models follow the ecological niche approach by assessing the suitability of habitat for species. The models use raster-based layers such as land cover, elevation, et cetera, as predictors of suitable habitat. The predictor data is combined with either presence and absence data or species abundance data in empirical statistical models. These models provide the basis for the case study that I will pre be presenting to you next. This project called a decision support system to monitor and inform chimpanzee habitat management was conducted by Lillian Pentillo with the Jane Goodall Institute with technical support from colleagues at the University of Maryland College Park. According to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, approximately 66% of chimpanzees have declined over the past 40 years. In fact, all four subspecies of chimpanzees have been classified as endangered on the IUCN Red List. Their declining populations are primarily due to habitat loss, hunting, and illegal bushmeat consumption. This project used information from satellite imagery to monitor habitat loss. The objective of this project was to develop a decision support system to monitor and forecast chimpanzee habitat throughout Africa to inform conservation monitoring plans at the regional and local levels. The image on the right shows the study area with the IUCN red list ranges of the four chimpanzee subspecies overlaid on top of data showing percent canopy cover. Although the Jane Goodall Institute knew that chimpanzee habitat had been disappearing for many years, it wasn't until they saw the forest loss from satellite imagery that they understood the extent of the loss over time and space. The red in this map shows forest loss between 2000 and 2014 in key chimpanzee habitat areas. The project team used chimpanzee presence data and predictor variables such as bioclimatic data, forest cover products derived from Landsat imagery, human population density, proximity to roads, and proximity to navigable rivers to develop a chimpanzee habitat suitability map at two different resolutions, one at five kilometer and one at 30 meters, shown on the right. The project found that elevation, Landsat ETM plus band five and Landsat derived canopy cover were the strongest predictors. More information about the methodology used in developing the habitat suitability map can be found in the paper listed at the bottom here, Jansen et al, 2016. Here is a list of satellite derived input data to the habitat suitability model, including direct spectral information from Landsat bands, information about forest structure, disturbance and fragmentation derived from Landsat, and topograph topographic data derived from the shuttle radar topography mission. So one of the questions we'd like to ask you is if you use remote sensing um, to monitor habitat suitability, which data sets do you find most useful? Do you use any of the data sets listed in this particular slide, um, or do you use other ones? So we'll give you about 30 seconds to just type into the question box um, some information about the, informa about the data sets that you use.
central to this project was engaging local communities in the conservation and monitoring process. Local villagers use mobile devices to collect monitoring data such as nest location. The project team members then showed them the habitat maps and the extent of habitat loss. Working in partnership with the villagers, the monitoring data they collect combined with a variety of remote sensing imagery and it's helped the Jane Goodall Institute as well as other organizations better track and understand the relationship between habitat needs and the status of forest habitats. The villagers use this information to make conservation and land use decisions. This map shows habitat suitability in 2014 with a majority of the habitat classified as good or very good, but some in the Northwest region classified as fair. But by 2016, much of the region had changed to fair or poor. Hopefully, by working with the local communities, the Jane Goodall Institute and other organizations can help develop restoration plans to improve chimpanzee habitat. Next, I will discuss how satellite remote sensing can be used for species population dynamics. One of the challenges of collecting information about animal species is that they don't stay in one place. They move within their ranges or migrate to other regions. Species population dynamics tries to determine the variation of species, geographic distributions, and abundances across space and time. The challenge for using satellite remote sensing is how do we get that information at appropriate geographic and temporal scales? especially in very dynamic environments like rivers or oceans. A great example is determining species population dynamics of fish in rivers. We know fish live in rivers, but how do we characterize such a dynamic environment and relate that to fish populations? There are several ways to collect information about location and abundance of mobile species for use with remote sensing data. These include direct observations, telemetry, and more recently, camera traps in environmental DNA or eDNA. Next, I will be describing some projects that use each of these methods for collecting species information. Whale Watch is a project led by Dr. Helen Bailey at the University of Maryland to help reduce human impacts on whales by providing near real-time information on where they occur and where whales may be most at risk from threats such as ship strikes, entanglements, and loud underwater sounds. Information about whale location was obtained from tagging whales and tracking them with satellites. This information was combined with sea surface temperature, chlorophyll concentration and sea surface height to develop models of whale occurrence. The results include maps of likelihood of blue whale occurrence as well as an estimate of the number of whales off the U.S. West Coast. This project, led by Dr. Gordon Lucart at the University of Montana, combines demography and genetic information from salmonids with environmental factors from satellite imagery and other sources to assess vulnerability to climate change. The team uses environmental DNA or eDNA to get information about the fish, which is collected from water samples. eDNA is genetic material obtained directly from environmental samples without any obvious signs of biological source material. The ability to combine landscape information with genetic information is really new and exciting. And the use of eDNA is an incredibly important emerging tool in conservation for monitoring animal species. The project found that variation in salmonid population productivity is related to environmental conditions and habitat quality and quantity. Some of the remote sensing variables used in this work are listed in the table on the right. You will notice a few satellite sensors that you may not have seen before, like AMSR-E. 
AMSR-E stands for the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer for EOS, or Earth Observing System. It is a passive microwave radiometer that measures precipitation rate, cloud water, water vapor, sea surface winds, sea surface temperature, ice, snow, and soil moisture. It operated on the Aqua satellite from 2002 to 2011. AMSR-2 was launched on the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA's spacecraft, on May 2012 and is still currently operating. Other types of data that might be unfamiliar to you is NAIP, which stands for the National Agriculture Imagery Program, which provides aerial photography for the United States. NASA NEX DCP-30 is the NASA Earth Exchange downscale climate projections available only for the conterminous United States. NASA GRUMP, or G-R-U-M-P, is the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project produced by NASA's Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, which provides information about human settlement and population trends globally. This project has developed a web-based support tool that allows decision makers to access and visualize information on fish habitat and vulnerability. It includes some basic vulnerability assessment tools and landscape genetic tools. It currently only covers the Northwest portion of the US. You can find out more information about the tools and methodology on the website listed here. Also, we plan on offering an introductory webinar on remote sensing for freshwater habitats in 2019. This webinar will go more in depth into some of the methodology used to incorporate remote sensing into monitoring freshwater habitats, so please stay tuned for that. So when we developed this webinar for the freshwater habitats, we're really interested in knowing um, what are some of the pressing topics that you're interested in and learning about how remote sensing is used for freshwater habitats. So we'll give you a few seconds to just type in the question box about things that you might be interested in um, pertaining to a future webinar. And then, of course, after this webinar is over, please feel free to contact me directly to let me know what you would love to see in the freshwater habitat webinar series. In this next project, led by Dr. Phil Townsend at the University of Wisconsin, it involves monitoring wildlife across the state of Wisconsin using trail cameras. A crowdsourcing platform is used to identify the wildlife species, and that information is combined with satellite remote sensing data to characterize the habitat of key species in the state. The trail cameras have been located through the entire state and have been wildly popular. A lot of volunteers establish and maintain those cameras. The numbers on the top reflect the numbers of volunteers, cameras, and photos in 2017. And the numbers in the box on the right reflect the numbers in spring 2018. So you can see how this project is very popular and continues to grow. One of the most innovative and successful parts of this project is the use of a crowdsourcing platform called Zooniverse. The photos from the trail cameras are uploaded to the platform and then anyone can identify what's in the photo. For example, in this picture you can see a deer and can select deer on the right as the animal that you see. This approach enables the identification of millions of photos and therefore locations and abundance of animal species. I encourage you all to take a look at it by going to snapshotwisconsin.org. I personally have had a lot of fun identifying these animals. 
these are um, just a few great pictures from the tra trail cameras and all the different sorts of animals in the state of Wisconsin. The project team has combined all the information from the trail cameras with satellite remote sensing data like land cover and vegetation indices to get better estimates of deer population size and locations. These images are a comparison of deer abundance using the old method on the left with the new method on the right. The old method did not use camera traps or remote sensing imagery. High abundance is in red and orange and low abundance is in blue and green. So you can see that the new method, which does use trail cameras and remote sensing imagery, shows a lot less deer in the north and a lot more deer in the west and the southwestern part of the state. As a result, the state will be able to manage their deer populations better. This project, led by Dr. Heather Lynch at Stony Brook University, used Landsat imagery to identify the location of penguin colonies in the Antarctic. Because the penguin colonies are so large and they nest on rocks, the imagery can be used to detect guano stains on the rocks. The team developed an algorithm for Landsat imagery that can automatically detect the guano stains. This allowed them to locate previously unknown colonies. Last year, the team used that algorithm to discover penguin and petrel mega colonies, which are huge colonies of birds. They acquired funding to send a research team to the Danger Islands, kind of, you can see where it's located on the right side here, based on the detection of a penguin mega colony. This was very significant because prior to the discovery, no one knew this large colony of penguins even existed on the Danger Islands. The image on the right shows the research team on Danger Island surrounded by penguins. So you can see how large a colony that really is. The significance of finding penguins here has been huge. Prior to this discovery, the Danger Islands were not considered a high priority for conservation, but this is now being revised as a direct result of this discovery. Lastly, I want to discuss the ways wildfire monitoring has been used for conservation. The best satellite products for wildfire monitoring are the near real-time products available from MODIS and VIRS. MODIS active fire products are available at one kilometer spatial resolution for the last 24 and 48 hours and seven days. The size of the fire that can be detected depends on many different variables such as scan angle, sun position, and so on but it typically detects fires a thousand square meters in size or larger. However, under very good observing conditions, smaller fires can be detected. The VIRS active fire product is an improvement on the MODIS product because of its an increased spatial resolution of 375 meters. It is also available for every 24 and 48 hours and seven days. You can access both MODIS and VIRS active fire products through NASA's Fire Information for Resource Management System, or FIRMS. It has a visualization tool, but it also enables fire email alerts and the ability to download data. You can access FIRMS through the website listed here. Next, I'm going to discuss a project that has used the near real-time active fire products for conservation monitoring called Firecast. Firecast was developed in response to the loss of tropical forest that is occurring every year for many reasons, including agricultural fires. The loss of the forest is resulting in biodiversity loss, carbon emissions, and degradation of ecosystem services. 
Firecast, led by Karen Tabor at Conservation International, uses active fire information from MODIS and VIRS to track various ecosystem disturbances, such as fires, deforestation, and protected area encroachment. It also delivers information about fire risk conditions all through email alerts, maps, and reports. Firecast currently operates in Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, Suriname, Madagascar, and Indonesia. The primary products for Firecast are hourly MODIS and VIRS active fire alerts and estimates of weather conditions to generate a daily indicator of forest flammability risk. Sea surface temperature and other data are used to forecast fire season severity. You can find out more information about Firecast through the website listed here. Next, I will show you examples of how Firecast has been used. In Bolivia, expanding agriculture and ranching has resulted in increased forest fires. Those fires increased dramatically in size under dry or drought conditions. Firecast has been used in Bolivia as an input into a national flammability alert system to alert local communities when conditions are particularly dry. The goal is to reduce burning agricultural fields during peak fire conditions. In Peru, the firecast data is used to provide alerts when there is forest disturbance. Local communities have used the alerts to fly drones over areas of su suspected illegal logging. I hope that this webinar has provided helpful information on how satellite remote sensing is being used for conservation. Specifically, I've shown you that it's successfully being used for assessing habitat suitability and being combined in very innovative ways with species location information to understand dynamic habitats and animal movement. Lastly, Near real-time wildfire products can be used to determine where wildfire and other disturbances are threatening protected areas. If you are interested in any of the tools or products or methodologies used to develop the tools or products, please either go to the websites listed in the presentation or please feel free to contact me. Again, um, I want to encourage you all to think about how these approaches, these methodologies, these tools that you've seen presented to you today, and the additional tools that will be presented to you in the biodiversity webinar, how you can, how you might be able to use this information um, in what you do. And we would love to get feedback on that. So what you're hopefully seeing at this point is a um, view of the website called Snapshot Wisconsin. This is the one I mentioned earlier that, that uses, the, um, uses crowdsourcing to uh, identify animals um, taken from the camera traps that are located throughout the state of Wisconsin. And then that information is combined with remote sensing data to get a better idea of uh, population size of different species that are located throughout the state, which is then used for decision making about managing those populations. So right now, um, this particular website is so popular that they tend to run through all the um, photos pretty quickly. So you'll notice that they, they have a certain number of people that they, after, after they've interpreted the photos, then they say that photo is finished, um, and then any other interpretations won't be included in the analysis. But I did want to show you this uh, since this last season is completely finished. So you see the little red finished up there, that means um, a bunch of people have already identified these photos, but I can still show you uh, how this works. 
So as you can see in this particular photo, uh, there's, a, there's a deer down here right in this area. And the really nice thing about this website um, and this platform is that you sometimes it's hard to see the animals uh, in the picture. So what you can do is actually look at a series of three pictures and you can see the animal moving. And this allows you to actually see the animal a little bit better. I've used this many, many times to try to figure out uh, what's in these pictures. Okay, and I'll just press this again so you can kind of see the deer walking across. So once you see that it's a deer, um, then you can come over on the right hand side and you see this whole list of animals, um, most of which you'll find in these pictures. Um, and you, about 70% of animals in these pictures happen to be deer because there's a lot of deer up there in Wisconsin. Um, and then you would click on deer and then that leads you to getting more information about the deer, whether it's young, um, whether it's an adult antlerous list, no antlers, whether it has antlers, um, or whether you can't see the head at all, and then what the behavior is, because the behavior then will let them know um, if they're eating or not eating or moving or whatever. Um, so this gives you additional information um, about what is going on in that image. And then once you, in this case, it's one um, adult with no antlers, um, and then the behavior is moving, and then you identify it, and then it goes on to the next picture. In this case, it's two more deer. So it's an adult um, female and her and her baby. And you can see, see them moving. So this is how the website works. Um, this is done through Zooniverse. Uh, Zooniverse is a really great platform for setting up these camera traps. There's, this was based on another uh, crowdsourcing website called um, Snapshot Serengeti. So you might have seen uh, some of those. Um, and then when combined with, again, with remote sensing, it really gives a, some powerful information about what the species, where the species are um, and the abundance of those species in the area that you're looking at. And again, if you'd like more information about this, I can give you uh, the contact information of Dr. Phil Townsend at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and then they can give you more information about how they were able to process these data which is no uh, easy task. The second website I want to show you is called MAPT, Mapping Application for Penguin Populations and Pro Projected Dynamics. Um, and this gives you some really great information about the location and abundance of penguins in the Antarctic. So on the left-hand side, you can see a map of the Antarctic. Um, and all these little orange dots are locations of penguin colonies um, that have been reported um, from different kinds of sources, uh, including the project that I told you about that use remote sensing to identify the locations of penguins. So you can click on any one of these things and get information about um, the penguin colonies. If you click on this and you can get to counts. In this case, um, the, pla the place that I located is um, has a deli penguins. Um, there's two different um, counts available. And then you can get information on the abundance, the date that those counts were taken. And in fact, this one goes back all the way to the 1960s. Um, and the abundance, the approximate abundance um, number of penguins that are there in each of these counts. Um, and then that allows you to sort of look at maybe changes over time and so forth. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is the dashboard. If you go to the dashboard, then it gives you information about um, penguins, uh, the different penguin species that are located um, in the Antarctic. As you can see, it takes a little while to, to get the information. Um, but this info data was pulled together from, again, from a lot of different sources um, by Dr. Heather Lynch at Stony Brook and her colleagues. 
And so right now you can see the total number of penguins, um, at least census on the Antarctic for each of the different species. So if you hover your mouse over each of the species, you can see um, this is a Delhi penguin, the Gen 2 penguin, the chin strap penguin, and the emperor penguin. Um, and then for each of these species, you can see the different locations where there's been counts um, census taken, either again through the satellite imagery um, re more recently um, or through different sort of methods, researchers going out there so and so forth. So this is really great information. Um, and not to say that a lot of you are studying penguins, but it's a really great example of how you can combine satellite imagery with actual species counts um, to provide information about those species. Okay, at this point, I'm going to go over to um, my PowerPoint. And I want it. I think a lot of you probably have not taken an RSET uh, webinar before. Um, we have, and just to let you know, right now, there are a lot of you online, and we're so happy that you've joined us. Um, there are 836 people listening to this webinar, so clearly, this is a topic of interest to people. Um, and for those of you that haven't taken our set webinars before, we offer both um, overviews and introductions. Um, and then we do more advanced webinars where you can actually learn a certain skill set, like um, how to do land cover classification, something like that. Um, so, and this particular webinar obviously was an overview webinar, um, but I just wanted to list some of the webinars that we've offer, offered in the past, um, including the top four, which are sort of overview introduction webinars, um, remote sensing for conservation management, which we did a few years, uh, several years ago, actually, um, forest cover and change assessment for carbon monitoring, um, coastal and open ocean applications. Um, and then remote sensing for scenario-based eco-forecasting. And then we've also more recently done some advanced webinars, um, mostly using QGIS, which is an open source um, geospatial software, including techniques for wildfire detection, land cover classification, accuracy assessment, um, and change detection. And then lastly, um, this last one that's listed here from Earth Observations to Earth Applications, that was a workshop that we did at the World Conservation Congress a few years back. And um, that has some really great sort of basic level exercises that you could follow as well. Um, I do want to remind you that although right now the our RSET webinar um, website is listed at the top, um, you can get access this information, um, the existing information on there. However, um, for this particular webinar, just to remind you that the materials, materi materials are located on a different website. That will change um, probably, hopefully, in a few weeks. I also want to remind you that if you have questions after the end of this webinar or in the following weeks, please feel free to contact me at my email address listed here or my colleague Amber McCollum at her email address. Um, if you have general questions about RSET, you can contact Anna Prados, who's the lead for RSET. And again, our RSET, our RSET website is listed here as well. So as uh, we stated earlier, uh, this particular webinar is uh, going to be one of a series of webinars on conservation and biodiversity. Um, and again, this webinar was an overview webinar, one to give you examples of how remote sensing is used in conservation applications, um, and two, to give you some basic information, um, 
especially next week about biodiversity um, and about GeoBond, which is the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, um, for those of you that don't know about that. And then we'll de be describing some um, case studies under that. But in the future, what we want to do is follow up with some um, very specific topics, um, and they could be advanced topics, so go into actual techniques on how, um, say, species distribution is done um, by, you know, incorporating remote sensing or something like that. So one of the questions that we have for you is, of the case studies presented here today, which ones show the most promise or, use, or might be useful in your work? Are there any of them that you thought, wow, I'd like to know more about the techniques used for this particular case study. So if you could um, write your question, write your answers in the question box, that would be very helpful for us. And I also want to let you all know that um, at, after the webinar is over, we'll be sending everyone a link uh, to a questionnaire that we'd like you to fill out if, um, if you can. And that will also ask you about potential future topics that you might be interested in. Um, everything that we do in our set is based on feedback that we get from people like all of you. And so it's really important um, that we understand which, which, what is of use to you. So at this point, we want to just thank you all very much for attending our webinar today. Um, and we look forward to talking with you again on Thursday about biodiversity. If you are interested in getting a certificate, remember to complete the homework by February 7th. Um, and, uh, and then you'll have to listen to both um, webinars live. You don't have to listen to the one this afternoon because it's just a repeat of what we did today. So at this point, we're going to go to questions and answers. Um, we have a little time um, to hopefully answer some questions. And of course, if we can't answer your questions, then we'll try to find the answers to your questions uh, probably later on in the week. Again, you can, you can also email us. Um, you can email me um, any of your questions that occur to you later. Um, and you can, it would, it's also really great if you can type your name, location, organization, and your email address um, if you want to connect with your fellow land remote sensing professionals. So at this point, we're going to, I think, switch presenters. OK, so the way this works, the easiest way to make this work is to actually um, have you type your questions in the question box and then we will um, put them in this um, Google document that you can see here so you all can see the questions. Um, and then I will try and answer them um, verbally. Um, and then they'll get typed at the same time. And then we'll make this question and answer document available to you um, after, probably in a day or so, after the conclusion of this particular webinar. So I'll start with the first question and just sort of work my way down. For question one, for the NDVI question, I've always wondered if what you're referring to would apply to cheatgrass since, since it greens up so early compared to native species. Um, yes, that's a great question. There's actually been um, a lot of studies done using remote sensing to look at cheatgrass. Um, and what we can do is uh, find some of those papers for you and give you um, information about where to locate that information. But you're right, a key component to looking at cheatgrass is when it greens up, because it tends to green up a little bit at a different time than some of the other um, grasses or shrubs um, around it. So it makes it a little bit easier to use a sort of a time series to identify where the cheatgrass is. Question two, how authentic is habitat suitability model 
for predicting the potential area of occurrence of any threatened plant species? That is a big question. <laughs> um, and I can't answer that question uh, in this particular webinar series because every model is different for one thing. Um, every study is different. So it, a lot of it depends on the ground information that you, you have. Um, I think one of the things that we are most likely to do in the future is have a webinar just on habitat suitability modeling and remote sensing. And what we'll do is we'll bring in some of the scientists um, um, that are working specifically in this area. And you'll hear more about some of those projects next week um, in the biodiversity, or next week, on Thursday in the biodiversity session. Um, but right now, that's a very, that would be a very tough question for me to answer um, in this very short webinar. But we'll get you more information on that. So there's a question about slide 31. I'm, what does that mean for interpretation? I'll have to go back and look at slide 31. I don't have it up right now. I'll, I'll get back to you on that particular question. Question four, how do you monitor guano? as temperature anomalies, monitoring of bacterial activity gases or something else? That's another great question. So in the case of um, penguins, the, the, those particular penguins, um, Adelie penguins and other pe penguins, nest on the rocks in the Antarctic. They don't nest on the snow. Um, and so the contrast between the guano and the rocks um, because there are so many penguins in a colony, um, is very apparent from the satellite imagery. You can actually see the guano stains on the rocks from the satellite imagery, and that's how they are able to um, detect guano. Now, one of the things that they're trying to do in addition to just detecting the guano itself is look at the spectral response of guano. So one of the scientists on that particular project is focusing on getting spectral information from the guano, and that will actually give them information about the food that the Adelie penguins are eating, whether they're eating krill um, or other things um, in the ocean, and give them some idea about the diet of the penguin and how that may be changing over time. So question five, do you have more information about removing, removing false positives um, for NIROPS VIRS data? I don't have the specific information about how the, the process for removing false positives, but we can get to um, information on that. If you go to the VIRS um, Active Fire website, there's quite a bit of information about how they remove the false positives. And if that doesn't provide you with enough information, we can get you in contact with the people that actually do that processing. So please contact us afterwards about that. Oh, and thank you, somebody's posting the actual website on the Q&A document, that's awesome. Question six, what algorithm or bands does the fire detection tool use? So the fire, the fire detection, I think you're asking about, with, about the satellite imagery. So both VIRS and MODIS have a thermal band. Um, and so it can detect um, heat um, that's emitted from the earth and it, it can also penetrate um, cloud cover and smoke and so forth. So it's a particular, it's a longer wavelength. Um, it's, it's longer than the near infrared 
Um, and both of those sensors use that band. Out of curiosity, do they send an email notification when there is more data to analyze? So I'm not sure exactly what this question is referring to. Oh, I see. Oh, for Snapshot Wisconsin. Okay. Um, yes. So if you sign up, if you go into Zooniverse, um, which um, in order to, uh, this is, I apologize, this is one thing I didn't mention. When you go into Zooniverse and you want to use Snapshot Wisconsin, uh, if you want to identify a lot of the photos, you actually have to sign into an account in Zooniverse um, for Snapshot Wisconsin. Um, and it's free. And then you provide your email address. And then when there's more data available, when season, say the next season, which I think is season 12 or 13, when they have photos available for that season, they'll contact you via email. So the question is, how does the team avoid double counting individuals? If the same individuals is captured on two different nights, are there ways to avoid double counting? So I assume this is for Snapshot Wisconsin again. I'll have to ask the team about that. Maybe what we can do is take your question and I can uh, contact uh, Phil Townsend and ask him how they do that. But I think that they probably take that into account. It's a really good question now that I sort of think about it. Um, I think they take that into account when they do the processing. And they know, you know, they, they look at the different days um, and maybe they only take um, one day for a specific area or or something like that. But it's a really good question. I'll try to find out the answer for that. Question nine, how do they ensure they are not overestimating populations in the areas that have cameras? So that this question is very much related to the question before this. Are the cameras located uniformly across some kind of grid system? So in this case, the cameras um, in Wisconsin have been rolling out over a period of years. Um, and there's a challenge to putting out cameras, right? Because a lot of it needs to go on private land. And in order to put it on private land, you need permission from the owners. Um, and in this case, over time, um, the private land of owners have been very supportive of getting the camera track, uh, getting the ca cameras out. Um, so, but because of those restrictions, they aren't putting out, they aren't being put out on a regular grid, um, and they haven't been uniformly throughout the state either. And so when they do the occupancy modeling and um, population estimates, they have to take all of that into account. But what they're figuring, what they're deciding is that even if there is a chance for overestimation or that the population estimates aren't exactly uniform, they're still getting better information than they did before they used this approach. So question 10, using sea surface temperature data to forecast the firecast. Yes, in firecast, is it because it is affected by the great conveyor belt that influences the weather climate? That's exactly right. Um, and again, I can get you more information from uh, Karen Tabor at Conservation International about the process used and why they're using sea surface temperature. But yes, it has to do um, about how weather influences the sea surface temperature and vice versa, and then how that impacts, impacts the weather um, on the land. Question 11, there are so many data sets products available, but there doesn't seem to be any single portal for, yeah, 
uh, I, I'm going to finish reading this question, but I know where this is going. Um, any single portal for searching for what's available to support specific research or for obtaining the information. Instead, we have to use multiple portals. Is there any plan for integration or provision of a single entry portal? That is a fantastic question. Um, and it seems to be one that many, many, many people are asking out of frustration for trying to find information that you want in one spot. And you're absolutely right. There is no one place you can go to find everything that you need. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and you'll see next week when we do, or next week, Thursday, when we do our session on biodiversity, there are many biodiversity portals. And one of the things that um, Geobon is trying to do, the Biodiversity Observation Network, is pull all of that information um, to be a network of biodiversity portals. So you can go to one spot for biodiversity, which will then lead you to other, um, other portals. Um, but, you know, that's it. That's biodiversity. It isn't all of these other things that you're talking about. Um, and I'm not sure if there's ever going to be one spot where you can find um, everything, unfortunately. But I know it's an issue, um, and I wish we could do so help something about it, too. We have the same problem when we try to find data, believe it or not. So question 12, again, in camera trapping, how is abundance calculated? I will have to refer you to the people that have actually calculated the abundance. Um, that Abundance is, and um, occupancy are not easy um, to calculate for that particular project. Um, but they do have some papers out that I can refer you to. And then if you want more specific information, I will, re I will give you the contact information for that um, scientist that work on that project. Question 13, this is an interesting question. Is it correctly understood that remote sensing should not stand alone? So I assume what you mean by that question is that you need to use ground information or other information along with remote sensing to figure out whatever question you're asking. Um, and in my opinion, the answer is yes, you need other information in addition to the remote sensing information um, to really figure out what's going on. Um, I, I have taught introduction to remote sensing for a long time, and I always tell my students that sitting at your computer and processing satellite imagery only gives you part of the answer. You really need to get that ground information and tie what you're seeing in the information um, in the imagery to what is going on in the ground to get the full picture. So there's a question, can we use VIIR for urban land cover assessment? So I assume that may be VIRS, yes, for urban land cover assessment. So VIRS is fairly coarse spatial resolution. I think for usually for urban land cover assessment, you need a higher spatial resolution um, at the very minimum, you know, Landsat at 30 meters. You might be able to get some kind of urban land cover assessment, but typically you need even higher spatial resolution depending on what your objectives are for your project. So I know there are a lot more questions, but we're, um, we're at our time limit now at one hour. So what we'll do um, with the rest of the questions is we'll actually answer them offline and then um, post the question and answer document um, on our, either on our website or on the site um, 
the FTP uh, link that we gave you earlier. And we might need to bring up that again or post it in the chat box. Oh, there we go. Brock just um, posted it. So we'll get the Q&A doc out there and then you can take a look at that um, at the end. And we'll do it uh, also for next week's, uh, next week's, Thursday's biodiversity um, session as well. So we want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, we had a huge turnout today, which again signifies the importance of this topic and the importance of using remote sensing for conservation and biodiversity. So we welcome your feedback. We will base future trainings on your feedback. Um, and I hope that um, we've been able to give you some useful information today. So thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again on Thursday about biodiversity. Thanks, everyone.